Okay, we're back with the camera calibration uh, parameters. I told you what, what are them. Now we're going to find out how we're going to calculate those parameters. Obviously, in real world, you don't really sit down and do any calcs. Yeah? You just put it in the software, software will give it you. The reason we show you this equation is not for you to remember or know. Yeah? It's just to show you what's happening behind the software. So if you do run the camera calibration as we did last year, um, you could get some parameter about, as I said, C, which is like principal distance. You get the, you get the coordinates of the principal point. Yep. Yeah, where it is. You get some information about the, you get something like this. If I want to tell you what's happening exactly. So have you done the calibration by, by any chance? Like any of you? Okay. We might do it today. <laughs> okay. Uh, you will see something like this, yeah? Some of these parameters. That's why I'm trying to tell you what are them, yeah? And how you're going to interpret them if there is any problem. Like if your K1 is out or K2, what's, what is that? What is the problem? How are you going to fix it, yeah? So, actually, K1 to K3 are parameters of the lens distortion, radial lens distortion, good? So how is happening or how the software is calculating them based on the Gaussian form formula, which is here, yeah? So actually K1, K2, K3 are those coefficient, good? Which can be solved using the, there are too many techniques. There is a direct linear transformation, there is a least square, which can find those unknown coefficient, every, everything, but it's not, our business software will do it for us. So we do, the, there are, I think, 13 terms, or at least I know is many of them. Good. But which, why we only given the first three terms? Because as it gets more than three terms, they are very small. Yeah. There are like something like 10 power of, I don't know, minus 20. Is it really important? No, it's, we can consider it as zero, yeah? In real world, you only, you convert this onto the balance form, we call, sorry, I should have said K012 or something like that. Good, the first three terms. In real world, you only consider this. And the rest, you assume that is insignificant and it's not really affecting you. So if you know these three terms and something wrong with your radial distortion, you can correct that. You can correct the curve line to be vertical. How are we going to do it? We run the camera calibration, we input that into the software, and then software will collect, co correct for those lens distortion toward the edges of the image. Radial lens distortion, sorry. Okay. In reality, this is for metric cameras that you need to have three. Good. If you have non-metric, you can even assume that two times would be more than enough, like it's adequate for your lens distortion. You don't need to find out any more terms. Something to know, radial distortion can vary with your focus. Yep. If you zoom, when we did that camera calibration with my students, I told them do not zoom in and out. When you're taking the photo of the targets to do the camera calibration, you never touch the zoom. So when you're zooming in and out, you change the focus. And if you change the focus, the radial distortion parameter will change. They, they all depend on the focus of the camera. Good? So then you have to find again. Yeah? So if you have a job that you need to focus on different, like you need to have different focusing, you probably need to do camera calibration based on t two or three different focusing. So anyway, when you, whenever you do camera calibration, do not zoom in, in and out. Just leave it as it is. So again, formula is available. Software will do the job for you. There is nothing to be worried. But how software is doing, software is actually considering two, two object distance. One very close, one focusing on infinity. Good? To be able to get that lens distortion sorted. Another distortion that your lens can have is decentering distortion. I told you it's due to your one element of the lens, either it's shifted or tilted, it's not in line with the other elements of the lens. Good. But I need to know from decentering, the P1, P2 I told you in the other slide, they're actually 
length this uh, this centering. Good. And then if you are squared and add the mom, it's actually referring to the calibrating uh, value that needs to be applied to your lens to be able to fix those errors. Do I ever again want to know what is this formula or examine, examine you? No, you don't need to know the formula. You just need to understand. So this R here again is the radial distance, good, to the center of the image. It's the same as the previous R we've got here, good. This is only two terms for the decentering distortion. There is no, no more term. Again, the centering distortion can be found when, when you have the close object and object at infinity. You assume, you focus on infinity. There is no object in infinity. And it can, they can find the decentering distortion. So, one is scary formula, which you're never gonna see again. But if you combine all those parameters I told you, principal point, focal lens, distor distortion due to the centering of the lens, radial distortion, it can be a very big formula. This is the formula software we use to solve all those parameters at the same time. Good. How many parameters or noun parameters do you have, do you reckon? So we have, let's see what we can have. We have, there is a correction to the axis of the image, which is your X and Y axis, correcting them. Uh, there is a correction to your principal point to be on the exact center of the image. There is a small correction to the principal distance if your focal lens is, is not exactly what it manufacturer says yet or needs to be corrected. K1, K2, K3 are your uh, lens distortion, radial lens distortion. P1, P2 are decentering lens distortion. Yep. C1 and C2, you don't need to know that. It's actually, uh, we haven't talked about that. It's just the affinity and shear parameter is some coefficient that needs to be applied. And then we have radial distance. We, how many of them we know? How many we don't know? I know the radial distance can be measured. Good. But the rest, do I know them? No. So if you're doing the camera calibration, uh, rule of thumb, like not all the software will calculate all of these for you. Like I know, for example, photo model only gives you 12, if I'm right. Yeah, 12 of them. So you need to have at least, I don't know, um, let me see, at least six images taken from the different view. And when we do the camera calibration, we don't take all the image from one, one view. We have to rotate and just take another one from this view, from that view. Like, you have to go around the targets and take from different incident angles, basically. So, anyway, we need to have number of targets to be able to solve this. So, it, it cannot be happened by only one target, yeah? So, when we did the camera calibration with photo modeler, I think we had about, if I remember correctly, it was 20 coded targets and we had to take about six image at least from the different view. Anyway, uh, we have, what is important, so far I just told about what's happening behind the software, but this is the stuff you actually need to know because this is how you are doing that, how we're doing the camera calibration. There are two methods of doing camera calibration. The first one called on the job calibration and the other one is self-calibration. What is on the job calibration? This is actually, I take that from the Albert paper. Albert doing research on the medical science. Uh, he has like human as an object and then he does some measurement about how they work. Like it can be different medical applications. So the on the job calibration, have you look at this frame here? Can you see this fr frame has some targets attached to that, like a white dots, good. So, in the on-the-job calibration, you have a frame with pre-coordinated targets, so all the targets are pre-coordinated, these little targets on the frame. So, what we have, we're using the control frame with pre-coordinated targets is placed over the object prior to photography, good. Before you do any 
taking any photograph, you put that frame with those targets, you know the coordinates of those targets, you use different method, you can use different method to get the coordinates of them. And then what you do, you take a photo of your object and that frame simultaneously at the same time. Good. When you're taking the photo, you're, as you see in the image, the frame also is in the image. The target here is just the hand of that person who has the target attached on the hand. Good. So my object is this one. And I'm taking the photo of my frame and object at the same time. And if you put those images in the software, it can calculate the camera calibration or interior parameters of the camera for you. Good. Do you reckon it's useful in surveying application? Have you ever seen someone doing that? Not too often, yeah? So on the job calibration is good for mostly for industrial purposes or medical science where the object is not too big. But in our purpose, for example, if you want to take a photo of the dam, can you fit dam and frame at the same time? No. No way you can do that. So on the job calibration is not so often in surveying application. There is another method which I'm going to talk about that in a sec. Good. So what is the advantages of the under job calibration is for non-met for is very useful for non-metric camera uh, where there is a need for you to focus every time. You know, do you remember I told you when we want to get the radial lens distortion, we shouldn't change the focus. Yeah. For medical science, sometimes they want to change the zoom or focus. You know, then if they want to do that the other technique doesn't work. They have to do calibration on the site where they change the focus. So it's very useful when you're doing this type of job. Uh, what is the other method which is mostly used in our application surveying is self-calibration, which actually what we did in the classroom when I was teaching photogrammetry and remote sensing with our students. So, how is working? You calibrate the camera before you're going out in the field. Yeah, you get all those parameters before going out. How I'm going uh, to determine that? You have a plan with the targets. This one is the metal plane, uh, so metal planes with the metal targets. Good. And then there is a scale bar in the middle here. And then there we take the photo. The, these targets doesn't need to have coordinates. They're just a target. Yep. Yeah? Because when you do self-calibration, uh, the absolute orientation doesn't really matter. We want to get the relative orientation. Again, you shouldn't change the focus, yeah? And then you take the photo from different view, and then you send it to the software. It, do it does the calibration for you and gives you the parameters. In real life, again, this is one way to do. This is probably a little bit old-fashioned. When you use, for example, software like Photo Modeler, and you want to do the camera calibration, you go, there is a section camera calibration and there is a section print the target. There are some coded target. You print them, you put them on the ground, you take a photo and then you calibrate them. I, I, if you haven't done, I probably repeat it. I will put up something online for you on the study desk and uh, you can follow and see how cool is this one to get the parameters. Anyway, so Let's see what we've learned. Um, so observation, um, we use some discrete targeted point on the object to compute the coordinates of the object point, and then we can get the parameters of the camera using the bundle adjustment in the software. We don't do that, yeah? Software does it for us. There is no control target with fixed coordinate. If you remember in on the job calibration, I told you there are pre-coordinated targets. Here we don't have any fixed coordinate. If you have, it's very good. You can then get absolute orientation as well. So there's no problem having the coordinates, but in real life you don't need it. So are we good with what is self-calibration technique, which is you're going to use most of the time? Okay. Now we learn about camera calibration, interior parameter, exterior parameter. Now we get to the most important part. How are we going to plan our close range photogrammetry? Good. And what are the things we need to consider? There are some network design constraints that you need to know. Like there, we, we might have the constraint in terms of uh, workspace, like whether there is obstruction or something. We need to consider how big is our 
uh, the infra infrastructure within an image, for example, whether I want to image a dam, whether I want to image a wind turbine, for example, as your assignment asks, good, that might be a different technique to use. Anyway, and then I, I want to know where I, where I need to put my camera station. What would be the best geometry for my camera station? It's pretty much like your network geometry for control in surveying. Where you put your control survey, you don't put all the control in one, one side, yeah? That's just not good. You're going to have the well-distributed uh, station all over the area. Similarly in photogrammetry. What I put here to show you how network geometry and camera station position can affect your accuracy. Have a look at This is a satellite antenna. Close range photogrammetry is very good for measuring the satellite antenna. So they take a photo, they see whether it conforms with the industry requirement or is there any movement or monitoring of the satellite antenna. So if you only have two, like if I draw my satellite antenna like here, and if I only take a photo, like a, where not probably my, this is this image. Good, I put my cameras exactly upright. I take two images. I have an overlap so I can create 3D if I want to. Do you reckon it's good enough? No, have a look here. See these arrow ellipses are uh, looks like this. So it the, probably does give you good enough accuracy in horizontal accuracy, but not really in depth or Z. We know that photogrammetry is not good with Z or depth or height, whatever you want to call it. But that geometry doesn't help either. Like two two photo is not enough for this case. Now I'm increasing my number of station to four. See, I'm taking four. And then this time, I have convergent, like, see this one here? They are convergent photogrammetry. So I'm taking a photo toward the center of the satellite, satellite antenna. And then you can see my arrow ellipse got smaller. Yeah, the arrow I have in depth is smaller than the previous scenario. So if you compare these two, good. Now, is it good enough again? So I have two like this, and I added two to be convergent toward the center of the center. This is not the best geometry either. So what is the best? If you take all convergent and toward the center, and then you distribute your camera station to have equal distance from each other around the satellite, satellite antenna. Good. So. Then it is the best geometry and it also gives you much better result than the previous one. Good. Obviously there is a small change between the second scenario and the third one as compared to the first one. First one was the worst one. So this is how your camera station position can affect your final precision. So it's very important to know where to put, how to put them, how to, whether it's better to take convergent or normal photograph and how it's gonna affect your final one. Okay, so if we move on, the next decision you have to make is about how or where I need to put my camera. Is object distance um, and how, like how far I need to put my camera from the object. Good? We call it object distance. Object dis distance, the maximum object distance can be find uh, using this formula here, which is based on the precision you want to achieve, the initial precision on the object or uh, estimated precision. It's based on the number of photos and we also have the Q, which is like a constant. Depends on your camera, whether it's metric or non-metric, that Q can vary, good. Usually we give, they will give it to you or you can find it from manufacturing information if you want to. So. If you substitute, for example, this, this value here, let's say the initial estimate of the precision is about uh, 0.05 mil, and then my focal length is 7 mil, and then I'm taking four number of the photos, and the Q based on my camera is 0.6, it's probably your camera is non-metric camera, and then I want to achieve, this is the precision you want to achieve, or desired accuracy, good? I want to achieve about five micrometer, 
secret, which is quite small. Yeah. Then how, what would be the maximum distance based upon that is about two meter. So if you want to achieve, for example, five micrometer precision, you have to put your camera within two meter of the object. This is the maximum distance you can have. Uh, if you ask me, I would think this formula can be expanded a little bit more advanced. Uh, we don't have it in the study book, but if you're really keen and you're interested, in reality, you have to also consider the scale of your object. Yep. Yeah? So if I'm, if my object is too tall, I can't be within two meter. Yep. Yeah? That will affect where you're going to put. So there is two other formulas that is based on the scale of your photograph. Then, um, what camera you're using, as I said, focal lens is affecting your uh, object distance. So what else is, what accuracy you want to achieve is affecting where you want to put the camera, how many photos you are taking, yep. So these are the factors. So if you look at your assignment, um, I, I gave you the precision you want to achieve. I said, for example, you want to do the, uh, take a photo and then you have to have like precision plus or minus 25 meter. I don't want you to do any calcs. It's just explain what are the factors you need to consider. Yeah. For example, you say, when I'm thinking about object distance, I will consider the scale of my photograph. Good. I will consider what is the focal length of my camera. This is affecting my decision making. This is how you're going to answer it. Don't do any calcs. Good. What would be the next uh, network constraint is resolution. So if your images doesn't have a good resolution, there is no way for you to achieve that precision requirement or desired accuracy. How are we going to make sure we have the optimum resolution, do you reckon? The targets you're using is affecting your resolution. So. Whether you're using the pattern targets or whether you're using like a simple circle target or retro uh, reflective targets, that will affect how good you can achieve or what type of precision you can achieve. What type of targets do we have? I didn't repeat it here because I knew that when uh, we had laser scanning, we talked about different type of targets. Do you remember Zenny? I'm pretty sure covered that in laser scanning. And then we are going to talk about the targets again in the metrology next week. What I probably explain only here is about the retro reflective, which is quite unique for photogrammetry. Like we know about, there are a few different types, good. We do have a circle targets, good. Circular shape targets are good in a way because the you can, software can mathematically calculate the center of that circle and know where it is exactly, good. So it's in, uh, cannot vary with the focus or lens distortion. It, it doesn't really affect that because that, that center is known, not quite lens distortion. If you vary the angle of incidence, sorry, and focus, it doesn't really change that. We do have the black and white thing. Do you remember these targets, which is the center is intersecting of two lines? We call them pattern. Um, targets. These type of targets are good in a way because you can see the intersection of those lines. Uh, they are not so much good in terms of precision, especially uh, because you have to either manually find the intersection, you have to, for example, click on the pixel picker and then go and find the center. And uh, if you do that automatically, sometimes the software doesn't really get the middle of that. That can happen. So it's not really precise. Then we have retro reflective targets, which are looks like a white little targets you can put on the object. Why we call them ref retro reflective? Because if you eliminate the light on them, they can reflect it back. So it can be used at night for or for moving objects. Good. When your object is dynamic, you better use these ones because this gives you better precision. And they're very good in terms of the accuracy that you can achieve at the end. Good. We, we also have Sphere targets, which can be used for laser scanning most of the time that you use Sphere. Sphere targets are good in a way because you can see them from all, all other, all the views and the center is also known. Yet no matter which angle you're taking the photo, the center of the Sphere is the same. It doesn't change. Good. And it can be viewed from all over the angles. That's why they're using laser scanning because your laser is rotating, yeah? And it's just 
getting the images. So if, if you use one of those black and white, which you can use again, but, you, but if you use those black and white, you have to put it on the wall or the facade building. But for Sophia, you can place them anywhere and they can be captured and easily can be used for georeferencing. Good. Or in uh, laser scanning for other purposes. So what else is affecting your resolution is the random noise so and the quality of the camera so if your camera has a uh, different size of the pixel it also gives you different resolution it's obvious yeah so if you have more pixels you get better resolution at the end yep have you seen you say 12 megapixel or i don't know 14 megapixel camera or 20 megapixel which we don't have obviously uh, but as it goes higher, is it it gives you better precision. Good. So, uh, but rule of thumb, the total number of pixels, which is like twelve pixels, I don't know, twenty one million pixels, is good to have like more number of pixels. But the pixel size itself, if it's your pixel size is small it creates noise in your image, which is not good for precision. Rule of thumb, never use very small pixel size camera for close range photogrammetry. Go for higher number or medium format camera and medium size pixel, they are the best, good. Don't go for very small one. Don't think if the pixel is very small is good, no. The number of them is yes, if there are more pixel is better. So that's why medium format are better than a small format camera. But the size of the pixel, don't the small size pixel, they create more noise for you. So, so far so good. Let's move on. The next constraint might be about your workspace. Good. I should have changed that to workspace rather than workplace. <laughs> that should that should be same same yeah but i think workspace is better time good so what would be the workspace can affect your obstruct uh, or oh, sorry create constraint for your network design for example if you have obstruction and you cannot image your object from everywhere what do you do that you have number of choice you either just take image from different angles or go closer to the image to just pass that obstruction or you can use the wider lens cameras to cover good the wider uh, angle lens are the good option for you uh, so in a way you have to reduce the optimum ray intersection geometry to just if you have any obstruction or indirectly use uh, or indirectly image the object in a way. Other op other thing that you may come across quite often is, for example, if I want to get the edges of the building, can I put any target on the edge? No, it's so hot, yeah? You cannot really get that edges of the building. If you look at the study book, I put actually some example, but we do have some targets this is looks like a coded target i don't know how close i'm mapping that the coded target are looks like a circle and is black and white good i put the image on on the study book so you can have a look so these are the circle yeah which has it's like a barcode good software can read them and get the position of them there are some offset coded targets that you can use you can just if this is the edge of the building, for example, this is your building, you can put that target and software knows exactly what is this offset. And it can calculate for that, where is that edge, which is, these are the things you can consider when you do close range photogrammetry planning. But rule of thumb, always take additional photographs to make sure that you don't need to come back to very well. So take as many as you can. So it saves time when you're processing and one image become blurry or something you don't need to take or come back and take another photo. You take extra photos from the scene. Okay. Another network design constraint is depth of field. How depth of field is varies and affecting your uh, Sorry, I put the wrong one. This is the depth of field. So 
if I simplifying, like I put here circle of confusion and shouldn't be more than 0.1 millimeter. But what is actually circle of confusion? You will hear that even if you do normal photography, not really photogrammetry in our purpose. So have you ever had, when you were a kid, have you ever had the magnifier and try to direct the sunlight into the ground and it looks like a light circle? And then if you uh, br bring it closer or far away from the sun, that circle is changing. Yeah, it's getting bigger and smaller. So that is circle of confusion. How is working in the camera? Because camera has a lens, yep. Yeah? And then light rays is pretty much your sunlight. Good. When it's passing through the lens, it actually should form the image on the film plane. Yeah, it should intersect, but normally it doesn't. It looks like a circle. Yeah, it either intersects closer or far away, and it creates the circles. Not that big, obviously. It's very little circle on the. So it doesn't look like a point. What I mean is like a circle of the light intersection cannot be the point, exactly. It's always a small light circle. That circle shouldn't, the diameter shouldn't exit, uh, ex excess or shouldn't be bigger than 0.1 millimeter in reality. So this is the, how big it should be. If it's bigger, then there's obviously something wrong and needs to be fixed. There is some, some problem. But how is affecting our planning what, what what does it do with our planning even if you're artist if i want to give you an idea of how have you ever take a photo and it doesn't look sharp and this oh, i shouldn't be closer or i shouldn't be far away i was too close to the object or too far away my image is not sharp enough that's actually what it says it says that you need to find what is the best distance from your camera to the object based on the accuracy requirement, you also need to consider what would be the best depth of field to have the sharp and good image at the end. Good. This is actually how uh, artists like photographer they're using. They have a table of depth of field. And for example, if they want to take a photo of landscape, good. Because landscape like trees are here, I don't know. Uh, so everything has different position. Good. There is no one object they want to map. And if they want to focus on infinity, it's impossible. Like they're, gonna, they're not going to get everything sharp. So to be able to get everything sharp, they have a table of the depth of field, which comes from the camera manufacturer. It's like what, what would be the, act, the proper depth of field for your camera. And then they will look at the table and say, oh, based on my depth of field of the camera, I have to be, I don't know, I have to focus on the object on 20 meter and I can everything, get everything sharp and good. Good? Does it make sense? This is one thing you need to consider. What is other thing which is affecting your accuracy is incident angle. Do you, do you remember in the previous image I showed you if you take the normal photograph or converging is affecting the do those arrow ellipses getting smaller or bigger? Do you remember? We changed that to converging and it was better. It might not be better. Depends on the shape of the object. Yeah. If you do facade mapping, doesn't really matter because facade itself is like a vertical plane. Yep. Yeah? And normal photography is even better. Yep. Yeah? But if your object is like a satellite antenna, which is like a curvy shape, then you better do converging. Good. Why is affecting your accuracy is the reason is if I'm using the circular target, have a look here, and I'm taking the photo straight upright of that target, yeah? If I do straight from the top, that target looks like a circle, yep? Yeah? But if I'm taking the photo from targets here, it looks like an ellipse. And that center of the circle from the center ellipse is different, yeah? When, when the software is processing that, it doesn't get it the same way. And that's affecting the final position of that target a little bit, good? So what would be, you might say, how I know how much would be my incident angle? It's actually based on your target shape. That's why I showed you here. If you're using different targets, you might use different incident angles to achieve the precision requirement. For example, if I'm using Sphere, doesn't really matter. 
I can take from any angles, yeah? Spherical targets, which we are using laser scanning most of the time, the incident angles is just irrelevant. It doesn't really affect the final precision, good? Because you can take it from anywhere. But if you're using the circular target, you better go for 20 degrees incident angle, no more than that. Like if you exceed in that 20 degrees, if you take a circle object here, you're not going to get any good precision. Good? You have to be within 20 degrees, roughly. Yeah? You're not going to sit down and measure it. Roughly by eye, you can say, you're very survey. We should be able to say where is 20 degree to me. So, 30 degree is the best for retro target or retro reflective targets, which gives you the good results. Good? Okay, doc. so this is another constraint, and we're done with the constraints. These are the things you need to consider when you're planning for the close-range photogrammetry. I will go through dynamic photogrammetry, which is only four or five slides, um, and then we are done with this lecture. Good. What is dynamic photogrammetry? So far, I just talked about your camera station is static. Your object also is not moving. I'm just taking the photo of the facade of the building. I set up my tripod, and I'm just taking the photo. Good. But how about if my I'm on a car and taking the photos, which happening in mobile laser scanning, yeah? Taking the photo or measurement as the car is moving. We call that dynamic photogrammetry. Or how about if my object is moving, like in your assignment, there's a wind turbine example that wind blades are moving and you want to take a photo. You're not going to stop it, yeah? You're not going to stop and take a photo and then... But what they do, they do dynamic monitoring, which is quite new area. This is the new stuff that you haven't probably heard in your photo and remote. So, again, I will show you some formula. I'm never going to ask you. The reason I put this formula is just to show you how it's affecting and what are the things we need to consider. So, dynamic photogrammetry is based on the movement of the object relative to the camera. Good? It can be your Object is moving or camera is moving. That's why I put, this is a static object, your object doesn't move. Like you are taking the photo of road corridors while you, your camera is on the car. The road corridors, they don't move, they are static, but your camera is moving, good? But they are moving in relation to each other. So, uh, another example. And have you seen ever in Hollywood movie they have some handheld which is moving and they're taking the video as the handheld camera is moving? There is also can be a UAV. UAV is taking photo of the ground. Ground is not moving, but UAV is moving. Yeah? It's moving and take a photo, moving, take a photo. It can be a car or it can be on a stable ground, as I said, for monitoring purpose most of the time. They, they might take a photo on a stable ground, which the ground is moving or has some vibration. Good. So, what is important parameter in dynamic photogrammetry? What do you think? Like, if I'm taking the photo as I move, what is the important thing I need to know? I need to care whether my image gets blurry or not. Have you ever moved and your image got blurry? That's the factor you, is affecting. So we have to be careful that our image not getting blurry. For your image not getting blurry, you have to have the correct time of exposure. Like you have to set that time of, time of exposure to be on the correct way in order for your image not getting any blurry. So. How you can calculate that? There are obviously depends on too many elements. So this formula, this delta S prime is actually a blur of the image. How blurry is your image? Is based on the time of exposure of the camera, velocity of your car, or the speed that your car or object uh, or camera is moving. M is the image scale factor. Good. If you know them, you can get how much or how blurry is your image based upon that. But do you actually sit down and calculate the blur of the image? No, you do the other way. You will say, okay, I, the maximum blur I can handle or my camera system can handle is probably one pixel. And one pixel is probably six micrometer or something based on my camera spe specification. I don't want to have exceed that maximum blur. 
if I don't want to maximum uh, exceed that, what would be my time of exposure? You do the other way, you rearrange the formula. If you rearrange the formula, you get this, yeah? You can get maximum time of exposure based on the maximal permeable blur that you can have. Good, most of the time is about one pixel. And the speed of the car and everything else. Then you say, okay, I get, I get these two formula. It's just rearranging this formula. It's not, it's no big deal. What is the formula in the middle? How can I get that maximum blur? I told you, you, you can get it. Yeah, based on your camera. The camera manufacturer, they use this formula to calculate that maximum blur. Obviously, you don't need to know. I'm not going to question you how you can calculate it. I just put it to show you how they get it. The maximum blur is actually the, depends on the power, resolving power, power of the sensor. It's based on your camera sensor. Good. So it's something coming from the manufacturer. It's nothing to do with you. Good. Rule of thumb, most of the time is about one pixel size. Good. Now, let's do one example. Sorry, I put my example a little bit further. And then see how we can use it. As I said, there is no question in the exam or assignment calculation question from photogrammetry. I just show you to give you an idea what is the time of exposure, how small is time of exposure. So, imagine you want to take an image of row of the house. You are in a car. Good. Your car is going with the speed of three kilometer per hour. So that three kilometer per hour is actually eight point three meter per second. Roughly, yeah. So, and your image scale factor is 2000, like your image scale factor. Do you know what is image scale factor? Do you remember we said 1 over 100, 1 over 200, 1 over 2000? That, that number is image scale factor, which is here is 2000. It's based on the object distance, good? How far you are from your object. And then you can calculate based on the focal length of the camera and distance to the object, you can calculate image scale. Anyway, maximum image blur should not exceed of one pixel, and knowing your camera that one pixel is, for example, six, uh, six micrometer, it is necessary to find the maximum ex exposure time for your planning, like what, what do you want to set to your camera to take a photo every, I don't know. And what is the resulting blur looks like in object distance, how big it is in object distance? Good. Now, how I'm going to solve that, I know the maximum blur is given, yeah? It's 6 micrometer. Do you agree with me? Now, if you remember the formula for T max was... Sorry. Good. If you substitute those values, I know there is an error. This H shouldn't be here. I will fix it when I put it up. Good. So maximum blur is 6 micrometer. Good. Uh, my image scale factor is 2000 is given. The speed of the car is 30 kilometer per hour. I convert it to 8 per, uh, to meter per second because everything else is based on the meter. Good. Now, your exposure time is 1 over 700 seconds. Time of exposure can be set in the camera. You, you can go and set it. Good. And then it can just take, bum, 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 taking a photo for you. This gives you not, uh, or the blurry is not exceeding the maximum permeable blur of the image, which is one pixel. But, if when I'm saying 6 micrometer blur on the image, good, this is the maximum blur you can have on the image, how, how big is in the object coordinate system or on the ground? You simply, if you know this is 6 micrometer, yeah, multiply that by M, which is your image scale factor, it tells you it's actually 12 millimeter on the ground. So that 6 micrometer is actually 12 mil. It's not really small that you think. It's 12 mil for 
we are surveyed. 12 meters is not, not, it's not that small. Good. So you're not going to exceed that 12 millimeter blur on the ground. Am I going too fast? Easy peasy. Okay. Now, so I have to go back one, one more now. So far we talked about a static object. How about if my object is moving? And my camera is, like you can have object and camera moving together, or you can have object only is moving. How I'm going to map that, or how I'm gonna image that? There is important things to know, like most of the principle are same as the previous one I told you, like that can be applied here. No problem. The only thing will be added is like if your object also is moving, the delta D is the distance that object moved between two exposure. Yep. So because my object is moving, if I'm taking photo and take another photo, the object has moved a little bit. Yeah. Me during that time of the exposure. And do you remember the previous one I've got looks like this? It was delta T, and I told you this is time of exposure. But here I have a small t. This is the error in time of exposure. I'm going to tell you what it is. Good? Or we call it synchronization error. So how is happening or what's happening? Like if I have the object is moving, say, like this. Yeah, it can be anything that's moving. I need to have at least two camera. And to be able to map or image that moving object, I need to have at least two cameras and those two cameras needs to be synced and take photo at the same time. However, they can be sync. For example, if you have a video camera, there is a film grabber that you can put and they, they take or they can take uh, the video at the same time and then you can just get the different uh, time or extract the image from those videos. So anyway, they can, they need this, these two cameras. So if to get the moving object, you need to have at least two cameras, which they are synced together. And that small t is actually the arrows between the syncing those cameras to take a photo. Good. So you're going to find out if my camera are not sync and they don't take an image at the same time, how it's going to affect my, like your object obviously has moved by the time they, the other one is taking photo. There is a gap between them. So, and you want to find out how much is moving and how it's affecting your precision at the end. Again, if I'm showing you these formula and numbers, but what I want you to know is like, I don't care about the formula, I just to, to find, want to understand there is an error with taking the moving object and how big is that error. So what would be my expectation if I'm getting any, if I'm using mobile laser scanning, what type of accuracy I can achieve? Obviously it's, it's not as good as laser scanning itself. If you've done the assignment one, oh, I'm not going to give away. There are a few students haven't submitted yet. Anyway, uh, we, I'm going to talk about that later. Uh, but. Uh, just forget it. Uh, okay. What I want to show you here. So imagine you have a point P at time zero. Good. And that point is moving to P T1 at time T1. Good. This is time T0 and this is T1 because I'm, I'm, my object is moving. And I'm taking the photo. Do you really think that you can take, like, I can, like, when my, Point is starting. I can get the coordinates at PT0 easily because it's static at the very first place. Yeah, you take a photo. But as it start moving and you take the photo, by the time you're taking the photo, you don't actually get PT1. You actually get P prime, which is virtual point. Because by the time you're taking the photo, the object is moved. So if I actually want to know where was that, is actually creating the error in terms of direction of the movement and in in toward direction of the viewing your image. So the delta x is the error it will carry out in the direction of the movement. Yep. And delta z is the errors will be created in direction of the viewing. So 
you have x prime and x double prime or whatever you call it so so this is your image plane and i have two two planes like i'm taking one photo and the object is moving i have two cameras at the same time yeah and taking image i told you you need to have at least two cameras so these are two cameras these are the center of the cameras good this is direction of the travel with the speed of v which is the velocity of your car. This is the first position, this is the second position because your object is moving. And I'm taking the photo from the first position. I, I, I'm trying to get, but actually I'm not getting this. I'm getting the virtual point because my object is moving. Yeah? And that virtual point, because it's moved, has the difference between the actual point and the point you are imaging. Is actually is like when I'm taking the photo the object has moved so I want to know how much is moved by the time I'm taking the photo there is an error with synchronization of the two camera and object is moving is creating some errors in direction of the travel as well as direction of the viewing which is in the, we are viewing in this direction here yeah? but the direction of travel is just perpendicular to the then there are two different formula to calculate those movement or uh, differences or arrows in directions. So, which is, remember, this scenario, uh, sorry, this scenario is when you are moving parallel, this, this, this direction of movement is parallel to your baseline. Do you remember baseline? The distance between two camera stations? Yep. So if I'm moving parallel to baseline, I can use this formula. But if I'm moving in any other direction, I have no, I cannot use it. But most of the time, your camera are sitting on the, and, um, and the car looks like this, and then you're moving like this. Good. That's why they try to do that. Anyway, what is these parameters in the formula? The H is the object distance. It is the distance from your object from your to the camera good the b is the baseline the distance between two camera stations delta d uh, is the distance your object is moving based on the velocity and the uh, error in time of exposure or synchronization of the two cameras we we can convert it to in reality because the arrows is happening in direction of the travel is actually, do you remember X parallax from photogrammetry? Actually, that error is actually your X parallax. Good, is, is uh, error, error in X parallax in a way. So we call it delta P X prime. Anyway, this is delta Z. And then you can also uh, do another formula which is based on the image coordinates on the left hand side and if you know the focal length and if you know the image in direction of the or viewing direction you can get that. All in all these are just the formula. All you need to understand what are these terms good and how I can substitute them. Again there's never gonna be an example like this. I just put the number to show how, how much, how big are those errors or those movements. Considering the previous scenario we had that we're taking the photo from the houses, row of the houses, and we are moving, yep. Yeah? If you want to know what would be the error and direction of the viewing and the movement, if, if you substitute all those parameters in the formula I've got in the previous slide, good. So, this is, I first need to know how much I move based on the distance. The speed is the same, is 30 kilometer per hour, which is 8.3 meter per second. I've got the image scale factor, I have the B, C, H, and X prime. Everything is given. And that all I need is just, I substitute everything. And then even they said that we need to, in order to not exceeding the maximum blur, our camera needs to be sync up to T, uh, which is equal to 1 over 500 second. So your arrow shouldn't exceed that. Your, they should be sync. As I said, there are too many ways of electronical ways to sync to two cameras. There are too many devices to be used. Anyway, for example, if you are using the video camera, you can use the frame grabber, which actually lets you to sync two cameras. 
Um, if you substitute those, then arrows in viewing direction is about 178 millimeter. Good. An error in the movement is 89 millimeter. What I want to show you here, if you use any mobile laser scanning, you shouldn't expect too, too good accuracy from that at the end. Good. If you have any moving object, you're not going to get millimeter accuracy. You have two, two arrows in based on the sinking, based on the movement of the object, which actually equal to this, this much. In, in, in this example, obviously, yeah? based on the speed of the car and how good is your camera and everything else. So, uh, I put some application of the high speed camera or close range photogrammetry camera. I put two, two examples for you. You can also have a look at in more detail just to show you that Photogrammetry can be used for high-speed object tracking, as I said, for dynamic object. This is an example uh, of the test has been done in USQ, uh, which was about the wind tunnel. Have you ever heard of wind tunnel? Good. It's high pressure air is coming and passing. They wanted to know when that high pressure air is coming and passing, how much is moving the, the tunnel itself. So they had two different targets, and this is how they set the cameras in the middle. Yep, in the test section, and um, they could, I think they could get the X, Y, Z for like two targets, how they're moving, and it was in real time, so it was very good. So you can use the closer photogrammetry for um, testing the moving object, especially high speed one. Uh, this is the satellite antenna example, which I told you, you can achieve the micrometer accuracy using the close range photogrammetry, which is quite impressive. So, this is the example of underwater camera calibration. Do you remember we talked about the uh, on the job and self calibration? This is the example of the calibration has been done for underwater photography, um, and they they could achieve the precision again up to one micrometer, which is quite good. So I hope you learned something. It added to your information about photogrammetry. Uh, we're going to have a tutorial on that for external students. They have to download the trial version of TBC and go through my tutorial for on-campus students. We're going to do it together and process some images from V10 Imaging Rover. Thank you.